From The Times and The Sunday Times, this is The Story. I'm Luke Jones. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. For more than two decades, this former postmaster has led the charge on exposing an almighty miscarriage of justice. Good morning, Mr Bates. Good morning. Uh, My name is Jason Beer, as you know, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Can you tell us your full name, please? Uh, Alan Bates. He and hundreds of other postmasters and postmistresses were accused of being thieves and liars. We now know faulty IT software is to blame. Alan went from ignored campaigner to winning a case at the High Court to inspiring even an ITV drama, which in January nailed this story right to the top of the news agenda. On Tuesday, he finally got his moment at the official inquiry. A, they didn't like me standing up to them in the first instance. B, they were finding it awkward. And C, I don't think they could answer these questions. The story today, fighting the post office. Alan Bates at the inquiry. Hi, I'm Tom Witherer. I'm a news and special projects reporter for The Times. This inquiry has been running for three years or so. In a nutshell, remind us, what are they actually looking at? So, yeah, this all kicked off. The first hearings were in February 2022. And we're looking at a scandal which over 15 years between 2000 and 2015 saw close to 1,000 postmasters, those are the owner-managers of post office branches, being prosecuted and convicted for theft, fraud and false accounting based on data from the faulty Horizon accounting system. Mm. And on Tuesday... Alan Bates finally got his chance to appear at this inquiry. He is one of these many wrong postmasters. Explain who he is. Yeah, so he was a postmaster in North Wales and he bought his post office in the late 90s. But as soon as the Horizon system was installed in his branch, money went missing, £6,000 within a few weeks. And three years later, having never quite come to an agreement with the post office what they were going to do about it. He refused to sign his accounts. They sacked him. And he then became the post office's greatest thorn Hmm. in this long, long running campaign, which he effectively spearheaded from his cottage in Wales. And of course became a proper household name with this ITV drama in January, um, Mr Bates versus the post office. Um, we know the sort of Toby Jones version of him from that, but in person, what's he like? You've met him. Um, he's an incredibly difficult person to deal with. I think, f- from uh, from from anyone's point of view, to be honest, he's he's uh, incredibly stubborn. He doesn't suffer fools lightly at all. Mm. He's got a master mastery of the detail, um, and you know, sitting through twenty years of history today in the hearing and seeing letters he'd sent, you know, he just. He's he's just such a fantastic campaigner because he refuses to take no for an answer mm. and any bull, let's say, thrown his way <laughs> Thank you. Um, is just, you know, he just doesn't accept it and he and he pushes back. Yeah. Um, so if he's if he's stubborn and doesn't accept bull, um, what was he like in the inquiry room then? Well, I think the the atmosphere was a bit different in the inquiry room today. It was quite jovial and quite almost celebratory because you know, this was sort of Alan's day. He's waited 20 years for, for people in authority to listen to him and to believe him and, um, and for people to, you know, as he put it, the narrative to change so that instead of it being, okay, let's listen to what the post office is saying, let's listen to what they're press people are saying, let's listen to what their chief executive is saying on the radio. Mm. Things have now switched around and people don't believe what the post office is saying because they don't have a very good track record of of um, of telling the truth in this case. And people do believe what Alan Bates is saying. Let's get into some of his evidence then. What did you learn from today? 
Well, the first thing I learned was that he'd actually given up work to pursue this campaign. Now, we obviously knew that he had been put out of a job when he was sacked. And part of me had wondered, um, you know, what he'd been doing Mm. to earn his keep since. But he was very clear today that he never expected to spend 20 years of his life fighting this scandal. I didn't set out to spend 20 years doing this. Um, I hadn't expected to be uh, doing this so much by myself, but it it got more and more complex, and it was very it was harder and harder to share out and work as a, a bigger group um, uh, to take things forward. So, uh, yeah, I did finish up sort of leading in a way. You know, he he felt that he had no choice but to front it, and. It, I think, you know, I very much took away that it became a cause and it became much more than just the sum of his case and the few others where he was particularly close to, but that it was a matter of principle Mm. that he couldn't let a bullying organisation win. We also got a glimpse inside some internal post office memos um, where you could see how they were describing Alan Bates. What were they saying? Well, the... Executives at the post office, I imagine, would have liked to have done anything they could possibly do to get rid of Alan because he was he was a, a stubborn thorn in their side for many, many years. Um, and his attention to detail and his um you know, his the fact that he refused to say no made him a very difficult opponent. Um and we saw evidence today that suggested a variety of ways that he was effectively smeared. Uh, Mr. Smith says, of the cases I'm aware, Bates had discrepancies, was dismissed because he became unmanageable. Was that ever explained to you, that you became unmanageable? No, not at all. And then Mr. Smith says of you that you, quote, clearly struggled with accounting and despite copious support, did not follow instructions. Uh, Firstly, did you struggle with accounting? No, no, not at all. Were you given copious support? (laughs) No. Um, And when you see the letters that he was sending to the post office before this all happened, it is literally meticulous. You know, he's writing things down to the penny and quoting previous bits of correspondence. I mean, this is, this is as... You know, I think a, a previous Times profile described him. You know, he's the details man, mm. um, so it's quite laughable to see that, and it did it did uh, it did draw a ripple of laughter in the inquiry room. And then later, the uh, one of the partners at a law firm that had been taken on by the post office to help them um, in the teen years, twenty thirteen. Um, they they described him as having a loose relationship with the truth, which I suppose is you know is just is always a way to to smear a campaign group you know they don't have the formality of a of an organization or a company they don't have fancy city pr teams behind them as the post office do so i think that those sorts of comments are very interesting and they and they can be quite telling that um, individuals in in powerful positions and organizations would rather it's effectively attacking the man rather than the ball isn't it mm. ed davy was in the firing line again yeah, I think the evidence today will renew pressure on Ed Davey. Um, we already knew that he had turned down an initial meeting, but then accepted one at a later date. When he was post office minister. That's right. So he's obviously government. The, uh, running the Liberal Democrats now, but yeah. he was the postal affairs minister from 2010 to 2012. Really important period in the in the timeline of this scandal because it, the, it had just broken out into the public domain. MPs were just starting to... Um, lobby on their constituents' behalf and there were various internal investigations that were starting to unearth signs that there might be something wrong. And Alan Bates went to Davy and and said, look, I've I've got this campaign group, I've got all these individuals and and this is what's happening. He initially was turned down in a letter that said that the post office run at an arm's length organisation. Davy did meet him in October of that year, so that was five months later. But we were shown some documents today that showed that the memo that had been prepared for him by the civil service said that he wasn't meeting him because Alan Bates had sent a follow-up letter, which, it should be said, um, accused Davy of 
uh, allowing the post office to be controlled by thugs in suits uh, and that this was all happening on his watch. The reason why that meeting was set up was because Channel 4 News were going to do a news piece and the civil service were worried that there might be some bad publicity. And Davey obviously has said that He was misled by post office management, as many others were. He wasn't the only one to question Vanell's and others about what was happening. And, you know, we don't have any absolute evidence that executives knew of um, issues in Horizon. Yes. And this is just one day's worth of evidence in this inquiry. As you say, it's been going on um, since, since 2022. Have we learned much from it? Have, what are the sort of moments that we've had over the years that have actually really shone a light or or demonstrated some of the problems that were going on? Well, the inquiry goes from a mixture of sort of blockbuster moments where you get really important decision makers who had, you know, central roles throughout the throughout the period that we're looking at, all the way down to the minutest nitty-gritty. So, you know, some of the middle management computer experts who were Um, running teams in the help desk or who are running teams preparing evidence for criminal cases. And what those details mean and what they're so important for is if we want to make people accountable and you want to prepare, you know, potentially prepare criminal cases in the future against individuals at the post office in Fujitsu, the evidence that will have to be presented to juries is going to be that sort of minute detail. And you know, for example, in the at the end of the last phase of the inquiry, which was at the end uh, sort of February, the one of the postmaster lawyers prepared this large document, which was filed as his sort of submissions for that the end of that period, where he named I think it was twenty two individuals that he believed there was sufficient evidence for a criminal case to be brought. Now, you know, those individuals have many of them have spoken in the inquiry. They've given their reasons why they believe that they had no wrongdoing. Hmm. Um, But that shows what the intent is from postmasters. They want the police, who are core participants in the inquiry, taking and reading evidence that isn't available to the public. They want these hearings to be the basis for accountability in the future. And we're only really, I guess, paying paying so much close attention, in all honesty, people might, like me, maybe not people like you, is because of the ITV drama. That's why we're so interested in, in Alan Bates. And a lot has actually happened since that drama put this story at the top of the news agenda. Can you sort of remind us what actually has happened since the drama in terms of progress as far as Alan Bates and the likes? So comp- yeah, well, concern. it didn't take long for the Prime Minister to stand up and announce a new law um, really the, the first of its type in our legal history, I understand, to overturn en masse hundreds of convictions for those crimes that I mentioned of fraud, theft and false accounting. Today I can announce that we will introduce new primary legislation to make sure that those convicted as a result of the Horizon scandal are swiftly exonerated and compensated. Um, so that was obviously very significant and... Um, that is going through Parliament at the moment. The hope is that those convictions will be quashed within a few months and then compensation starting at £600,000 will be paid to each of them by the end of the year. The compensation continues to trudge on relatively slowly. I mean, a billion pounds had been earmarked for it. It's split into three schemes. It's all very complicated. And postmasters continue to say that it's effectively too legalistic. Rather than just taking the claim and and being happy to pay that money out, lawyers are going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards asking for medical evidence and accountancy evidence and documents from 17 years ago. And the process is very slow. And, you know, the Times revealed a couple of weeks ago that two pounds has been spent on lawyers for every pound paid out in compensation. Wow. So that's where taxpayers' money's going, unfortunately. And then, you know, the on that continuing road to accountability, Paula Venels decided that after probably three or four years of pressure on this particular point to give up her CBE. Um, She'd already given up a number of her public jobs. She had a chairmanship in the NHS. She was a non-executive director in the cabinet office. She sat on boards for Morrison's and one other retailer. Um, Her CBE was sort of the last thing standing and, and she did decide to give that up. And we've had more questions about what Paula Venels knew and when, not least because some of your reporting in The Times unearthing these secret recordings. Explain how they fit into this story and what they show. 
So around 2012, an independent investigation was ordered into Horizon accounts and a forensic accountancy firm called Second Sight were brought on. And it seems that um, that they were taking recordings to you know to, to to ensure they had their own record of things that were being said hmm. as they're perfectly entitled to do um and these have been kept under wraps for all these years um until they were formally requested by the inquiry so those have all been handed over to the inquiry and um you know we reported in the times in january just very tiny snippets of them and more of them have been broadcast on television channels in the last couple of weeks and what they hint at is exactly who was involved in discussions about whether postmaster accounts could be accessed remotely without postmaster's knowledge, whether that team in Fujitsu, um, the covert operations team as it was called, was using this at all, um, and what investigations were happening about that at the post office, and who knew, as you say. So, you know, the probably the most damning section is where one of the executives just below Paula Venos, the chief executive, says, you know, I've briefed Paula on this. I've briefed Paula that we're investigating this. Ouch. Because two years later, post office evidence to the to the High Court says that and to the business select committee says that post office accounts can't be accessed remotely. Mm. What happens to Paula Venels next? Will she appear at the inquiry soon? So she's appearing for three days at the end of May. Um, oh, soon. I understand her witness statement runs to several hundred words. So that'll be that'll be take a fair time to trudge through on the morning of her evidence. But she hasn't spoken publicly about this since 2015. Mm. There's been various statements put out. Was that when you appeared on her doorstep? That was 2019. Oh, okay. 2015, she was at the Business Select Committee. 2019, when you knocked on her door, <laughs> yes. she kept shtum. I don't think we count that as a public no. statement. <laughs> and also, Channel 4 doorstepped her this week as well with yes. a camera. She again didn't say anything. Paula, can I ask you to make the statement that you made, just so um, in, ter- in terms of the public inquiry? Have you got anything to say about that? Paula, you're accused of lying to MPs. Did you lie to MPs? Well, I have some sympathy with her not saying anything now, because she is about to give evidence for 21 hours mm-hmm. um, over three days. Um, the you know the, the the only substantive statement we've had from her was when she gave written evidence to the business select committee in 2020 Mm. and she you know she laid out what we would expect the skeleton of her defense to be which is that she said that she was misled by her it experts who told her that the system was robust she says that she was misled by her the lawyers in her criminal team who said that the way that they were conducting cases was legitimate and she said that the attempts to mediate with postmasters fell apart because postmasters were too difficult. I think this probably comes back to our man, Mr. Mm-hmm. Bates. Um, so that would appear to be where she's going to where she's going to stand. My opinion seem, is that she seems uniquely unable to sort of take a step back and consider how, as the leader of a company over a long period, you know, and, and prosecutions started many years before she arrived, and the majority of them had already been completed by the time she took over. But she was at the post office for a long time, from 2007 onwards, and became the boss in 2010. Um, postmasters accuse her of a cover-up. She denies that. Mm. Those three days of evidence may shine light on it. And she says that she is focusing on giving that evidence to the inquiry, which is previously that's She's previously said in a statement, I continue to support and focus on cooperating with the inquiry and expect to be giving evidence in the coming months. This is obviously a few weeks ago that this statement came out. She says, I'm truly st- sorry for the devastation caused to the sub-postmasters and their families whose lives were torn apart by being wrongly accused and wrongly prosecuted as a result of the Horizon system. Tom, you've been taking us through the latest out of the post office inquiry. Alan Bates um, has been giving testimony and uh, we've been thinking about what questions this leaves for the post office, for people like Paula Venels. Um, Of course, there are many people wanting to get justice out of all of this. There are some people for whom that will be very difficult because their lives have been so irreparably damaged by it. You've been reporting in the paper about the Siva Subramaniam family. Way back in 2005, the mother of that family was out at a party with her kids. Tell us what happened when she returned home. 
Yeah, so earlier that day, her husband, the postmaster in Putney in southwest London, had been audited. They had found a shortfall of £179,000 in the post office, and they had taken documents, sealed it up, and put him under investigation. Now, when she came back from that party, she found her husband's body in the attic. So, I mean, really one of the most appalling stories of this whole scandal to think that you know, that death came just a few hours after whatever happened at that audit obviously had a very significant impact on him. Um, and the investigation, it appears, didn't stop there. He had a number of staff, so it wasn't clear whether that money had been stolen by someone else. And what that meant for the his widow is that she felt harassed by letters about this shortfall all the way up through the post-mortem and the funeral. Fast forward 20 years and... You know, if it's possible, the, the 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 bit that makes your blood boil even more is in her application for compensation. She's actually been rejected because um, the independent panel who rule on cases in this flagship scheme, the Horizon Shortfall Scheme, found that on the balance of probabilities, the shortfall couldn't be said to be related to Horizon, and so it didn't fall under the scheme. And they said that she was not the postmaster, and that the scheme was for postmasters. They said in a letter um, dismissing her claim that they had no reason to believe that the audit didn't have a significant role in his death. Hmm. Um, and so having made that and having having heard what we've heard about all these different cases and you know, the impact it's had in, in families like hers, it is quite amazing when a billion pounds of compensation is going out and hundreds of millions of it is going to lawyers, that there was no room to give her something for, for what has happened to her. Yes. And Mr. Siva Subramaniam, correct me if I'm wrong, is the fifth postmaster we know who has taken their own life That's after right. these issues. Nadim Zahawi, um, former Chancellor, of course, um, MP, um, wrote in the Times that there is a case for an investigation into corporate manslaughter at the post office. Is this something that could be pursued? So what we know so far is the police are looking at possible fraud offences at the post office and they're looking at um, possible perjury at uh, amongst former Fujitsu staff. Um, I read what Nadim Zahawi wrote. I think, you know, of course it's really for the police and their legal experts. I know they're being advised by you know, some pretty serious criminal barrister KCs on what might be possible to, to work out what crimes would be most appropriate to pursue. You know, and they have to manage their resources with what they think that they can win convictions on. Hmm. Um, you know, my understanding of corporate manslaughter is it wasn't necessarily designed for this type of case. Um, it, you know, a lot of them are sort of health and safety type things and it's very difficult to prosecute and get convictions and when you do the company just gets fined which might make sense for a private company which is you know let's say running a factory and there's some awful thing happens because they haven't been following health and safety in this case I think what Postmaster wants to see is individual accountability they don't want to see um, a corporate thing and who's going to end up paying that fine? Well, the post office is owned by the taxpayer. Yeah. The taxpayer is already ploughing a billion pounds into um, into compensation. Presumably, if they were fined by the courts, that money would go from the business department in Whitehall to the treasury next door. So, you know, that's my personal opinion. I'm not saying that others may disagree. And have the post office commented on the case of um, Mr. Siva Subramaniam recently at all? So, in response to the case, the post office has said that they... They recognised that the claim related to truly tragic circumstances, um, but said that every single claim is assessed by an independent panel which recommends the outcome and that offers can be disputed. I understand the family are looking at finding a lawyer to go through that um, mediation process, so that will be the next step for them. Hmm. But as you can imagine, it's already been four years yes. and on they go. And that is a particularly... Um, upsetting extreme case in the midst of lots of other upsetting cases of miscarriages of justice. In terms of the the broader fight for justice, the kind that the Alan Bates of this world are fighting, do we know what justice would look like for them? Yeah, I think they th they see it in three stages. The, f the first one is trying to get compensation payments out the door as quickly as possible. 
Um, now, we know that progress has been made. Two-thirds of the 4,500-odd victims have been have received money. But of those that remain, the 1,500 or so, they are the most severely affected. There's cases like, uh, like the postmaster you just heard. Um, and Alan Bates and his 500 uh, postmasters that he led through the High Court, they are mostly not yet compensated. Um, and you know, I heard from a few today in the audience saying that they were still battling in the sort of they were getting offers that were fifteen percent of what they wanted, or it was twenty one percent of what they wanted. So you know, really quite a quite a lot less. And again, this is just it just takes time, and it feels like they're grinding forward. Where you know what they had hoped was that okay, we've won a court case in twenty nineteen. We didn't believe that in twenty twenty four we'd still be having going through this process. It's fighting for compensation and what were the other two things? And then the, there's the inquiry which we've discussed about you know getting that record of what happened, mm. hearing, you know, I mean the amount of evidence the inquiry has got and heard is quite extraordinary. I think somebody mentioned today 176 million documents. Good grief. <laughs> I, I mean, good for them. I have no idea where you would start. Yeah. Um, so, so there's that and they are doing in some ways the work that the police will would otherwise be doing you know yes. they have a well-resourced team at the back looking at those documents pulling it all together and then the the police's work can begin in all earnest next year that's sort of stage three people wanting to see individual accountability um and to see you know some of those people who work for the post office in Fujitsu stand in the same dock that postmasters did all those years ago and maybe end up behind bars i mean is that the kind of thing we're talking about or are we in the realm of Slaps on the wrists. Yeah, well, the Postal Affairs Minister himself said yesterday that you know, if there are criminal charges to be brought, if they are brought to a court and a jury convicts, that he would like to see people in prison. Yeah. Just finally, how's this been for you? Um, going through all this inquiry process after reporting on this story, seeing someone like Alan Bates finally get this moment, I mean, has it been stressful, <laughs> enlightening, odd? Well, I mean, it was bizarre to come back after the new year and to see the you know of course we knew that the uh, ITV drama was coming um, but you know me and one or two other journalists have really been plowing a lonely fur furrow for about the last five or six years trying to get this story onto the agenda knowing really that it 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 was a huge scandal and you know lots of the people who are in the uh, who were portrayed in the ITV drama, lots of the people who were interviewed afterwards were people whose stories we had raised before many times. Mm. So, I mean, it's really quite amazing and shows how unpredictable the world is that we live in yeah. and and the news cycle. And the, you know, the inquiry is just fascinating. We, In those years, you know, we used to fight tooth and nail for single documents, either through court processes or freedom of information or, or, or whatever through sources. Now... It's all been handed in truckloads. The There's inquiry, hundred or whatever million. I mean, today was it was almost exhausting the number of documents that were being shown. I mean, there must have been three, four, five dozen. Um, so you know, it's it's incredibly enlightening, and um, you know, it, it says a lot about seeing to, to be able to see under the bonnet of a scandal like this, to see every email, every piece of legal advice. Um, it just shows, in my mind, you know. When something this awful happens, the the significant number of people who need to look the other way, mm. that's when the worst scandals happen. That was our reporter, Tom Witherow. He has been totally across this story from very early on, getting scoop after scoop on not just the wrongdoing and the stories of some of these postmasters, but also the alleged cover-up as well. You can find all of Tom's award-winning reporting at thetimes.co.uk if, if you have a subscription. If you're interested in this story, when the enormous Mr. Bates versus the post office drama actually aired on ITV, we delved into how a TV show managed to do what years of news coverage failed to and we spoke to Tom about that we will pop a link to that episode in the description if you fancy a listen and if you know someone who else is into this story why not send them a link to this episode
That is it from us today. The producer today was Priyanka Deladia and Ed Halford. The executive producer was Will Rowe. And sound design and theme tune was by Mao Lissetto. 